It's a crypto crackdown as a PBLC says transactions are illegal. The Evergrande saga continues as they miss a key dollar denominated interest payment. The debt ceiling is looming and bonds are falling. Answer those questions and more on today's show. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And yes, we will talk about at some point why treasury yields are getting slammed higher all of a sudden. But first, we need to head over to China and talk about this crypto story because this could have repercussions for people who are believing and hoping and betting, investing, that cryptocurrencies are going to go substantially higher. And let's head over to uh, Bloomberg, where we see China widens the ban on crypto transactions. Bitcoin tumbles as their central bank, the People's Bank of China, says crypto transactions are illegals, and they are vowing to root out illegal mining activity of digital assets. Let's see what the reasons for that is. Is they say crypto-related transactions will be considered illicit financial activity, including services provided by offshore exchanges, the People's Bank of China said on its website, and add the cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin and Tether, are not fiat currency and cannot be circulated. Now, this is really important because if we talk about transactions, and there's, this is something that I think a lot of people don't understand, is that cryptocurrencies are right now broadly perceived as a speculative asset class. People are betting on them going higher due to the weakness of the dollar or the dollar getting for a weaker, perhaps as a replacement to the global monetary system, perhaps when all of these other systems eventually fail, the people will go and invest and put their money in crypto, causing the price to go substantially higher. But there's one thing you really need for anything to be validated, and that is transactions. If you've ever purchased a house or sold a house, well, I guess if you've sold one, then you have to have bought it at one point, you'll know that the realtor will run comps. Or if you've had an appraiser, they're going to look at comps. And what does that mean? Transactions and transactions validate the usefulness of something. So if you're just holding an asset, let's say you have a classic car and there's not many of the kind of car that you hold, but nobody is selling them. Let's say for a decade, nobody sold one. How do you know when you put it on the market what it's worth? There's no transactions. And that's really the key for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. They need transactions to validate what they are. And that would also get more people to use them. So obviously China says no to that, but let's find out where the story is going because Chinese officials are going further to stamp out crypto trading for its ties to fraud, money laundering, and excessive energy usage. Now, I think the last one is probably the most interesting one of the three. China's already rule has rules that bar banks from offering crypto-related services, and to get around such rules, traders have moved to over-the-counter platforms and offshore exchanges. China's ban, quote, on all cryptocurrency trading activity will have some short-term impact on valuation, but long-term implications are likely to be muted. It says the assistant professor of finance at Warwick Business School. So he says it's, a, it's lack of use is not an issue. The fear, the risk that you see here is will other companies adopt similar to rules that China has? And the energy one is an issue because energy prices are going higher. People are still mining these things. They still have an interest in mining them and that drives energy prices up as well. And when you have a lot of people, particularly those on the bottom 50%, as we talked about in the daily, uh, the, the daily show, the Real Vision Daily Show, is people need some relief from higher prices and they're forced to pay higher energy costs. So the question is, will other governments follow suit with what China's doing. Let's continue on because there's still a little more that I want to share with you on this and that crypto mining's massive energy consumption is also part of the reason the industry is coming under scrutiny. In a separate statement, China's economic plan agency that's an urgent task to root out crypto mining and the crackdown is important to meet carbon goals. So again, I still think there is going to be a push from other, other countries to perhaps follow suit. And that indeed is part of the risk here. But I also want to think you to think of this is how people in China are using it to get money out of China because China also restricts money flowing out of the country because, well, let's face it, if you have yuan, you probably don't really want it and you'd like to get rid of it, particularly if you're rich, you'd like to move it offshore. Well, if, if the government is restricting that, how could you do that 
still legally, well, maybe not now th through cryptocurrencies is you could take your yuan and you could buy a bunch of crypto mining uh, equip machines, put them in a room or building that you'd have to buy with yuan, hire a staff to run it, set it up and maintain it and pay for energy all in yuan. Now, what do you get out of that is you get a cryptocurrency that you could sell on the open market through an exchange. And what could you get from that? Perhaps you could get dollars, you could get yen, you could get euros, you could get something else. And maybe that's something else is held offshore. So I still think there's another underlying reason and just not just to the energy usage here, but I think the PBOC wants to keep money from getting out of China. They know that this is a way that money's getting out. Now let's continue on with the Evergrande story because just when we think it might be over and there's underlying rumors that China or Beijing is gonna bail out Evergrande, well, maybe they're not. Let's go back to that story and see what's going on because there still are risks here. And the fact the risks aren't even new, China Evergrande Auditor gave a clean bill of health despite debt. The PricewaterhouseCooper didn't, get this, didn't include a growing concerning warning on its annual report for the alien, alien property, not alien, a, alien property developer. Because again, the risk is, you know, somewhere between 30 to 40% of China's economy is real estate. And we saw in the U.S. what happened during the great financial crisis. So here you see that uh, yet the property developers auditor gave it a clean bill of health in an annual report issued this spring. And now, <laughs> and so here you go. When Evergreen's auditor, PricewaterhouseCoopers in Hong Kong, signed off on the company's 2020 financial statements, it didn't include a so-called growing going concern warning those red flags come from an auditor that show its doubts about the company's ability to stay afloat for 12 months and here we are just then 12 months now and of course what do we see that perhaps Evergrande won't survive and what did they say they were asked and of course no comment now we move on to what is now the question of going forward is what is Evergrande going to do? Because they just entered the grace period as they missed a payment on their dollar denominated debts means they are now delinquent. They're not defaulted. They're delinquent. They have a 30 day grace to make their payments. And that is the question is the world's most indebted developer has no signs of having met the 83 and a half million coupon payment, which has a grace period before any default could be declared. Now we know this is not a new thing for Chinese companies. They tend to, if they miss payment, enter into a period of delinquency and generally they they find a way out of it. And if not, you tend to see some restructuring. There's still the questions remain. What will Beijing do? What will happen to Evergrande? And will this be the domino that tips over the, the Chinese property market. Well, what did China do? Well, they responded by uh, adding 71 billion in cash this past week to calm nerves, injecting cash into the banking system. And here you see this through their overnight borrowing costs, ease amid PBOC's large cash injections. And you can see they're just off the charts of compared to where they've been. And now then you see the China starting to make preparations for Evergrande's demise as Beijing reluctant to bail out the country's most heavily indebted property developer. So kind of going against reports we saw on Wednesday, perhaps they're just thinking they're hoping not to, is asking local officials across the country to prepare for a possible storm. And what does that mean? Is the officials characterize the actions being ordered as getting ready for the possible storm, saying that local level government agencies and state-owned enterprises have been instructed it to step in to handle the aftermath not only at the last minute should Evergrande fail to manage its affairs in an orderly fashion. And they've been tasked with preventing unrest, mitigating the ripple effect on home buyers and the broader economy by limiting job losses. And that nice scenarios that have grown in likelihood as Evergrande's situation is worsened. Absolutely, that is a risk there. So then all of a sudden we go over to Zero Hedge and what do we find out today? The China steps in to enforce Evergrande funds used to complete housing projects not pay creditors. I want you to think about that. Normally creditors get priority here, but Beijing says not so fast. Uh, with <laughs> Here we go. Um, Bloomberg reports that China's housing regulators stepped up oversight of China Evergrande Group's bank accounts to ensure funds are used to complete housing projects and not diverted to pay creditors. And so now you have the whole 
concern from creditors, are they going to enter default if they don't have the money because they're being forced to prioritize consumers and investors in property and the housing market that could have repercussions. Again, we've talked about this this past week is you know, when loans go into default, that means banks have to reserve more, asset managers have to deal with this. It is a problem that nobody actually wants and it leads to tighter financial conditions. So we'll continue to monitor the Evergrande story, see if they make their payments in 30 days or if this indeed is that first domino that could tip off a global recession as we're starting to see in the economic data things slow down but now we've got to go to the u.s and talk about the debt ceiling. so many of you have been asking what does this matter when it comes to bond prices and i've avoided it is there any reason well let's go look and see what's really going on here congress juggles agenda to avert government shutdown and default as the Democrats and the Republicans duke it out. And here we see Democratic leaders on Capitol Hill running against multiple critically important deadlines as they navigate fraught political landscape where any misstep could have dire consequences for the national economy and President Joe Biden's legacy. And so while some of the worst case scenarios, a government shutdown, a federal default, I know this is what people are worried about, or the complete collapse of Biden's economic plan are unlikely and it's true, several obstacles, obstacles stand in the way as leaders manage intertwining negotiations and competing political agendas. So here's what I want you to understand is the, the probabilities of there being a default are super duper low. And I, I'm, I want you to understand this is just political posturing. And it doesn't matter, you know, right now we, we know who the parties are, but historically it doesn't matter if positions are changed. When you have one party that is the majority and you have another party that is a minority, but when the majority needs the majority, minority to pass something or do something, the power in the minority becomes very, very strong. And so effectively policy can't move forward that normally would because the minority can step in and put a halt to it until they get what they want. And hence you get political posturing because if things go wrong and things do, and, and they can, then the minorities will say, Hey, look, their fault, vote them out of office. Again, it's political posturing here, but let's go on and see what the story is and when this has to happen. Both parties largely agree on a short-term extension of federal funding through December 3rd, but Democrats have attached the debt ceiling suspension to that must-pass measure, and Republicans say they won't vote for it because they don't approve of Democrats' plans to spend trillions on more social programs. And so here we have the current government funding, as most know, runs out September 30th, so lawmakers must reach a deal by then. That would be next Thursday. To avoid a shutdown, the likely scenarios of lawmakers, here you go, strip out the debt ceiling language from the funding bill and find another way to address the debt. It's possible they could pass a one or two week stopgap funding measure to continue negotiating with Republicans. And that is exactly what this story is probably going to end up like. And that's why I'm not talking about a default in bonds because the U.S. government, Congress, they're not going to allow it. They know better. Again, it's all political posturing. So that brings us to the question now of what's going on with the bond market, because what did we see uh, just in the last two days, this mega slamming of yields higher and what could be causing it? Is this finally the market saying, hey, we finally believe in this inflation story. We finally think this is it. Now, remember, if we look at the charts, which we'll cover in more detail on the Sunday chart show, hey, we believed it here and here and here and here, and now, but now this time is the real time. Uh, there's a couple potential reasons here. One, uh, this was brought up on Twitter, that could this be due to the quarter end rebalancing because bonds have outperformed stocks over the last quarter? Yes, that is entirely possible uh, that coming into the quarter end, these rebalancing programs start. Uh, what is the other reason is, it's not just the Fed talking taper, but we're seeing global central banks talk ta taper. And the market is perhaps never in 40 years been so convicted that interest rates must go higher. And so this could be the fact that investors finally believe that, hey, if central banks back off the gas a little bit, then finally rates must go up and they want to be on the short side. They want that bet. And so now they're doubling down with a great deal of conviction. But what have we seen every time the 30 year gets over 1.9% and near two lately? 
and that is buyer step in. You have to remember the Fed is making massive purchases every month and they're not likely to, well, we know they're not gonna quit at least until November. This is the first possible opportunity that they will have to announce a taper and they probably won't say it starts immediately. So there is gonna be continued QE purchases for at least the next two months before at the earliest they could be scaled back. But what about from the treasury standpoint? Do you understand, and what I want you to understand is that note and bond issuance went up during the pandemic because of the bill issuance went up. And so what the, what the treasury does is it issues new debt and bills and then it refinances that into intermediate and longer term notes and bonds. And it does that on a monthly basis. So as bill issuance and government spending reverts to more normal levels, guess what's gonna happen with note and bond issuance? They're gonna drop back down as well. But if QE doesn't drop back down, which it doesn't look like it will for two months, that means those purchases from the Fed are gonna have a bigger impact. And now you can see why people that are shorting this are betting on something that is highly unlikely to happen. Plus, soon enough, we'll see the next payroll report. And as we talk about economic data, well, that's the wrong screen. We didn't want that one. We need to move over here and move on into the economic data and see what's going around the world because we've got preliminary factory data. We've got unemployment reports. Where is the economy going? Let's start with Australia. Our friends down under manufacturing PMI increased at a bit faster pace. On this Again, these are all preliminary data. Uh, services sector continues to get beat up now contracting at a slower rate than the month before. Moving over to the Eurozone, let's just hit the broad Eurozone. Manufacturing PMI expanding at a slightly slower rate than the month before, and the services sector expanding at a, bit, a little bit slower rate than the month before. Going up north to Great Britain, uh, manufacturing PMI expanding at a slower rate. What, so what are you hearing right now? Why don't you, expanding at a slower rate, momentum is slowing, services sector expanding at a just touch slightly lower rate, slower rate. And then we move into the US and here we see the market, manufacturing PMI expanding at just a bit, just a slightly slower rate than before. And how about the services sector also expanding at just a slight bit slower rate than the before. And why does that matter? Because when the factory PMIs and the services PMIs start to slow down, it has a reasonable relationship with GDP growth, indicating that the US economy is going to indeed slow down and come off of this fiscal cliff. Let's talk about the Chicago Fed National Activity Index. This is a really good uh, statistic because or data point because it covers so many things. It is a national index. And what do we see? The sales, orders, and inventories, personal consumption, and housing virtually unchanged, only just slightly higher. But what was driving the CAF NAI up to 0.29, which is a, sl a slowdown from the month before. Remember, zero is, is on target, so this is a better than on target report. Unemployment, employment, unemployment, probably mostly unemployment, and hours work. We know those were up too and production and income. So if you have production up, unemployment up, and sales and consumption down, well, what does that tell you? The likely direction for the national economy indeed would be lower. Let's take a look at the initial jobless claims data because these are now these numbers are turning back up. We're seeing 351,000 uh, seems to adjust claims last week, perhaps indicating that the bottom of the unemployment sector is a bit over 300,000. Remember, this is 50% higher than it should be in a normal economy. We still see pandemic claims. They Now, they did drop 856,000 to 11.25 million. Now, mind you, some of these people should be completely getting off their claims. And let's go down into the footnotes here uh, because the question is, why are we still seeing this? Let me see if I can find it. Uh, where did it go? It's in here somewhere. Ah, backdated claims may be included in these figures. So there are some people potentially still getting paid on these programs, but remember the $300 a month federal benefit is indeed gone. All right, let's continue on with the story into what we have is the Kansas City Fed 10th District Manufacturing Conditions. And what do we see here? Uh, the diffusion index showing this sort of percentage of 22% of firms reporting an increase production, only 16%. So that is 
uh, a little bit lower than the month before. We're seeing a slowdown across the board here. Uh, volume of new orders, only 4%. Again, slowdown. Backlog of new orders, slowing 20, only 26%. Number of employees, only 19% of firms. Uh, work week, only 10% of firms raised a work week. Prices received 41%. So that was actually some, some good news uh, for uh, prices received. Prices paid, though, were 77% of firms reported increase. So then how you're seeing here is the negative side of that is that manufacturers are absorbing these prices because they can't pass them on. Uh, new orders for export, only 4% of firms of supplier delivery times are falling. Uh, only 43% of firms reported an increase there. So you're seeing kind of, again, the validation of a slowdown here. And then we head over to the new home sales and what do we see a uh, month over month a nice one and a half percent increase but the year over year down 24.3 percent is finally we're cooling off from all that demand going into the pandemic after the pandemic when people went crazy buying homes so kind of the overall trend here is what we're seeing is indeed the economy looking like it's slowing down at a point where everyone's betting on higher interest rates. Remember, higher interest rates don't necessarily go with higher consumer prices because if there isn't enough money to afford consumer prices as it is, which there isn't, then higher interest rates, higher borrowing costs is going to make consumers even less likely to buy them. Well, I'll see you on Sunday if you're here with us for the Sunday Night Chart Note Show. And if not, we'll see you then again on Monday. We'll see what the stories bring us. As again, as always, thanks for being fans. Thanks for supporting the show. And I'll see you soon. I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Bye now. The content of this video is provided as educational information only is not intended by investor or other device. It's not to be construed as a recognition or solicitation by our site security, financial instrument, or participate in any particular training strategy. This video was prepared by Steam Van Meter. Personal capacity, pins expressed as video that our own do not reflect the value of Alice Financial Advising or Steam Van Meter Financial.